QuickBooks Online 2024, adjusting entry accrued interest. Get ready and some coffee because we're getting the business on target with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Gig Ray Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Open the major financial statement reports as done every time. The reports on the left. In the favorites, we're going to right click on that balance sheet to open a link in a new tab. Right click on the PL to open a link in a new tab. Same with the trustee trial balance. Let's tab to the right. Close up the hamburger and change the range up top. Going from a 10124 tab, 02924 tab. We're going to put a month by month side by side and run it. Tapping to the right, closing up the hamburger, and we're going to do it again on the range change. 010124 tab, 022924 tab, month by month, broken out, running to refresh it. One more time, tapping to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range. 010124 tab, 022924 tab. We're going to select the month by month breakout, run it to refresh it. Let's go back to the balance sheet. Last time we gave a general overview of the adjusting entry process typically done at the end of month or year. We're doing it at the end of February because we only have two months of data input in order to get the financial statements as close to as possible. The accounting basis, usually an accrual basis, but possibly you would need a similar kind of thing if you're doing a tax basis for the end of the year so you can get your taxes done. So we're first going to look at the accrued interest. So this is going to be related to the loans down below. So let's go down to the loans here. With the loans, we're going to have a few things that we need to be doing with them. Uh, one is that we have to make sure that we break out the interest. Note that this could be done a few different ways. If you are a bookkeeper, you might try to say, hey, look, this is a pain for me to break out the interest and accrual portion every time I make a loan payment because the difference between those two change every time and I can't automate the system. So one thing you might do is you might say, hey, look, I'm just going to record transactions that clear the bank feeds by just recording them as a reduction to the loan. And then I'm going to realize that, that I'm not properly recording interest, but rely on my CPA or accountant at the end of the year to make an amortization schedule and break out the interest portion versus uh, and get the loan balance to be correct. That's one issue. Another issue is that, uh, or, or you might do it periodically based on the amortization schedule. We would make the amortization schedule and record the proper amount of interest and principal per loan payment. Another issue is breaking out the short-term and long-term portion of the loan, something necessary for external reporting if you're going to be providing the balance sheet, but not possibly necessary if you're doing it just for taxes and you're just looking at a schedule c because it's just the income statement so that would be a breakout between two balance sheet uh, accounts another issue that could happen that we're going to look at here is is that we have accrued interest that we need to be that we need to be accounting for as well so that's going to be the one that we're focused in on this time so we're going to focus on this one a particular loan we're going to make an amortization schedule related to that loan and think about this accrued interest situation so let's go into it this was our amortization schedule for the large loan that we put together to break out the loan payments 
I'm going to make another schedule over here. I'm just going to add to it, and I'm going to call this first one like loan one or uh, loan one, and I'll call this one just loan two, loan two. And I'm going to make a quick amortization schedule just so we get an idea. I'm holding control and scrolling in just so we get an idea of what's going on with the payments and, and then why this adjusting entry might be necessary in some cases. So I'm gonna select the entire worksheet by selecting the triangle, right clicking on the worksheet, format the cells. I like to lay down the foundation, like laying down a base beat on when I'm doing my, my wraps or something, or I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna say none on, the, on that and we'll say that uh, we do want the decimals. So I'll keep that and then I'm going to go down to the to the home font group, make it bordered. And then I'm going to put the information about the loan on the left. So I'm going to say the loan amount was $5,000. We're going to imagine it's just a three month loan. So it's only three months long because we're going to try to maximize the amount of interest so it's relevant. And then I'm going to say the rate is really high because it's a short term loan. Again, I'm trying to maximize the interest rate so we can see an, an adjusting entry that would be relevant. Uh, 0.35, 35%, I'm gonna say home tab, numbers percentify that. Now note that that would be the rate on a yearly basis. So a rate on a monthly basis, this would be the rate per year. And that's often the rate that would be assumed if someone doesn't say year or month but we're actually paying it on a monthly basis. So we, we could break it out to rate uh, rate per month, month, which would be then equal to the 35 divided by the number of months in a year, 12. And then if I percentify that home tab, numbers percentify, adding a couple decimals, we get something like that. Notice there's a huge difference there. This is a big, you know, rate, which people can try to make sound smaller if they break it down to a monthly, a monthly rate. So we have to be mindful of that. And then I'm going to calculate the payment with our payment calculation. I say negative. I usually start it with a negative PMT and then brackets. And we're going to pick up the rate. We could pick up the 35 divided by 12 or just this number, noting that this number is actually longer than this because it extends beyond two decimal places. So you just, you don't want to type in 2.92% or 0 0.002. You want to use that cell. And then comma, uh, the number of periods is three in months, not years. So those two things have to be matching. And then comma, the present value is the loan amount. So we're going to say, okay, so there's the amount of payments that we would be making on a monthly basis. We can say, okay, that would mean that the total payments, payments that we would make over the life, I'm gonna make this a little larger, of the loan would be, we're gonna make three of those, this times three. And that means that the total interest over the life of the loan would be equal to the total payments minus the loan value. So 294.46. Uh, okay, let's break this out on a period by period basis now. So I'm going to I'm going to make C thinner, a skinny C. And then I'm going to put the periods periods and payments and interest and then I usually do two cells here, the loan reduction, because it's going to be long. And instead of having it in one cell and wrapping it, I'm going to put it in two cells so it doesn't make a fat or long nosed one, like a horse with a long nose. We want, I'll just make it two cells. So loan balance, balance. Oh, hold on, sorry about that. <laughs> now I have got my soundboard. I hit the, key, the keys for the soundboard. All right, let's go ahead and center this. And then I'm going to go in the font group and make this black and white. And then let's make this home tab font group and bordered. Okay. And then the periods I'm going to imagine, let's make this a date format. So I'm going to select the whole column D and I'm going to make this formatted to a short date so that I can say the first is going to be 02 
15, 24, and then 02, 15, 20, oh, 03, <laughs> oh, 03, 15, 24, and then 04, 15, 24, and we could probably copy that down to get the last one, 05, 15, 24. We're gonna put it on the books. We're gonna imagine we put the loan on the books on 215 of 5,000. And then we're gonna make three payments. We'll imagine they are installment payments. Now note, uh, they don't necessarily, we, we might not be making basically monthly installment payments. It might be a case with a loan such as this that we're gonna pay it all back You know, after uh, three months, in which case the interest calculation you know, might be larger over that time. But let's, let's say we're gonna make monthly payments. So what would that look like? Well, the payment's gonna be the same amount. It's gonna be this. I'm gonna select F4 on the keyboard, dollar sign before the B and the five, because that's outside of my table. So when I copy it down, I want it to move down. And then I can copy this down and I'll get the same amount all the way down. And then the interest per month is gonna be equal to this 5,000 times not the yearly rate. If I take that, I would have to divide it by 12 or I can just multiply by this monthly rate, noting and remembering that this is longer extended beyond just two decimal places. So I'm gonna say, okay. And then the loan reduction is gonna be this payment amount minus the interest, the rent on the purchasing power, meaning that the loan balance is only gonna go down by that, even though we paid that. Therefore, the loan balance is 5,000 minus the 161899. This is the new loan balance. I would like to copy this down, but if I copy it down, this cell is going to move down. That's a problem. Therefore, anything that's outside the place I'm working on, I want to use an absolute reference. So over here in B4, I'm going to put an absolute reference, F4, dollar sign before the B and the 4, enter. Then I'll select these, fill handle. I can just double click on it, boom and copy it down. So there we have it. And so let's put some borders around it to uh, home tab font group and some borders. So we're going to imagine that the interest was on the books at 5000. And we haven't we haven't yet made a payment, right? And in 15 days have passed. So we have actually used half of the interest, right? So so if we break it down, we've actually consumed in essence, half of the interest at this point in time, because 15 days have passed, I'm not going to pay until next month. So technically, I should be picking up the interest here that has actually been accrued, which I have not paid yet, which of course would be interest of this divided by two. Now in our example problem, this is a small, uh, fairly small dollar amount. So it might not be significant. It might be what we call immaterial and therefore you don't really possibly need an adjustment for it. But you can imagine a situation if it was a, a you know, a larger loan that this 15 days of interest expense could be a significant dollar amount. And it's going to, it's similar to like rent. Oftentimes people have a better idea of being able to, to visualize rent. Uh, if for example, uh, you have an office building and they gave you and you were allowed to use the office building and then pay the rent at the end of the month or the end of the year, then even though you haven't yet paid the rent, cash hasn't happened, you still consumed the expense. You're in, you have to pay the rent because you've consumed it, you've incurred it. Therefore, you should be recording the expense. The expense in, that, in, in those cases is usually kind of good from a tax standpoint because obviously we expenses are deductions possibly, and you might get uh, a deduction for that. So that's going to be our adjusting entry. I'm going to say, okay, we, we're not going to actually pay this interest until next period, but we should be recording 7292 of interest. Now remember, this is this adjusting entry, this whole amortization schedule is something that as a bookkeeper, we might say, hey, I would like the tax preparer to deal with that. For, so from, from us in an internal bookkeeping standpoint, we might use this amortization schedule to help us break out the interest and principal portion every time we make a loan payment so that we tie out to the loan balance, in which case you'd still have to do possibly this adjusting entry 
if it was significant, right? Uh, or again, we might, as the bookkeeper, say, hey, look, I'm just going to record each of these payments as a reduction of the loan balance, ignoring interest and this accrual for the 15 day uh, situation. And you, tax preparer or accountant, at the end of the year can construct this amortization schedule and then break out the proper amount of interest according to the amortization schedule and do this added accrual adjustment if you think that 15 days is necessary. And by doing that, notice again, the bookkeeper can, can or if you are the bookkeeper and the tax preparer, you still might do that because then you can automate your payments. I can automate these payments to happen automatically through the bank feeds, not having to break out a difference between the principal and interest. And at the end of the year, I'm still going to possibly have to create the amortization schedule if I have to do this entry anyways. So I might as well possibly do the whole thing, you know, at the end of the year, that might be a little bit easier of a system, just just to point that out. Okay, but right now we haven't had a payment happen yet. So we're just going to record the fact that that 7292 is interest that we should be putting on the books as of now. So let's go back to the first tab. And we can do that with if I hit the drop down, we typically want to do these with journal entries. Note that there's no forms for these adjusting entries because these adjusting entries are not part of the normal cycle. They are adjustments. And the fact that we'll be using journal entries will make it easier to see that these are adjusting entries. Uh, so we're going to make all the adjusting entries as of the end of the period. We're going to put a memo saying they're adjusting entries and we're going to use generally journal entries. All of those things being somewhat unusual, making it easy to see where the adjusting entries are happening. So let's, but we don't really, we, we might not do it with a journal entry if we can use a register, it might make it easier since, since there's only two accounts affected. So let's look at the register situation. If I go to the transactions, uh, and then the chart of accounts, you'll recall that there's a register, not just for the checking account, but for every balance sheet account. So in here, we're going to, we're going to do an adjusting entry for, for basically two, uh, balance sheet. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for one balance sheet account. Now we notice we're looking at this loan right here. So this, so you can, you can imagine that we own, we have a liability of the interest on the loan that has accrued. Typically, we will not put that in the same loan account. We might call it interest payable. That's what I would typically call it, right? Interest payable or accrued interest. I like the term payable more. Accrued interest is possibly more, uh, I don't know, classical of a name. It's a interest that has accrued up that hasn't been paid. But payable sounds to me like a liability and it seems more clear. So that's what I will use. So I'm going to make a new account and I'm going to say it's a liability account. It's going to be an other current liability. So we're going to say it's going to be in other current liability. And we're going to call it uh, loan payable. Let's just call it other current liability. And I'm going to call it interest payable, interest payable. All right. And then I'm going to say, why is the E out there like that? That's weird. And then I'm going to say save and let's find that account now. So it's an other current liability account. So I'm looking at my, my accounts here, assets, fixed assets, other current liability. Now it's an alphabetical order. Here's the interest payable. That's the one we just set up. Let's go to the register. And that one, I'm gonna now do a journal entry in the register. So I'm gonna go to a journal, since there's only two accounts affected, and I'm gonna say as of 0229, two four since we're in the leap year here so that's going to be the cutoff date all of our adjusting entries are as of the cutoff date you might say hey well wait a second that's a problem because why it's going to be wrong as of the 28th because as of the 28th we should have had you know 14 days and notice it's not really exact because there's a leap you know 15 days is i'm assuming half a month so we're still doing some estimates which you're going to have to do most of the time because uh because we're going to say if it's in material, then, you know, we're going to try to get it to the closest we can, often using estimates, right? That's what has to happen. But you might say, hey, look, it's not right as of the 28th, because there was still like 14 days or whatever, that would not have been recorded as of that point in time of expense. And, and that's correct. It's wrong as of before that or imperfect 
as of before that time with all of the adjusting entries for the most part and we're accepting that we're going to say that's fine because we're going to we're going to say that we're we want a process that works from the bookkeeping standpoint internally and we're not going to mess it up just to have everything perfect every single point along the way in time but rather make it as easy as possible and sacrifice the exactness during the month so that at the end of the month or year we can then just do an adjusting entry getting it right at the point in time that we have external reporting in the format of tax returns and or possibly financial reporting all right so we're going to say this is going to be then i'm not going to put a payee i'm going to put a adjusting entry so notice all of my memos i'm going to put there's an adjusting entry so that means notice if there's a separation from the bookkeeper and the adjusting department or even if you're doing your own adjusting entries then it gets confusing in terms of why why did the bookkeeper is going to say what what happened here the accountant did something something and it messed up my accounting well we want to clearly identify that this was an adjusting entry so if there are questions about it we can ask the question so we will identify that it is an adjusting entry by one putting a memo two putting them all as of the end of the period month or year whatever we're working on and three they're all going to be entered using journal entries which is a form not often used in the normal accounting process so then we're going to say this is going to increase 72.92 and the other side is going to be going to interest interest expense so we called it interest expense and we have these sub accounts i'm just going to say interest expense all right and so this is so that's going to be the journal entry so let's go ahead and save it and check it out if i go back into it and, and i was to edit it then it's going to take me into an actual journal entry you might feel more comfortable doing journal entries if you have a uh, a bookkeeping background that's totally fine i'm going to put the description on both sides you could just use a journal entry which would be a credit to interest payable and the other side the debit going to interest expense i'm just showing the register and how we could use it which would often be a way to do it if uh you only have two accounts affected if you have more than two accounts affected the register is going to be more difficult and debit and credit really is is the way to go but let's go ahead and save and close we'll see that in future presentations balance sheet if i run the balance sheet we're going to run it and then we're going to go down and say that we have down here in our payables interest payable 7292 7292 if i go into it we can see that it, it's marked clearly as an adjusting entry and it is a journal entry and if i go into that journal entry it'll take me to the form which is the default form if no other form is to be used of a journal form in the format of debits and credits closing that back out the other side on the income statement let's run it to refresh that we have interest income towards the bottom here it is if i go into the interest income we have more there of the 7292 so we have impacted the income statement let's go back we have increased the expenses which is going to decrease uh the net income on the year for interest that has accrued because we've been using the purchasing power of money for which we have not yet paid because we're going to pay it in the following month paying it in accordance with the amortization schedule now the next question is well should there be a reversing entry for the transaction is this a temporary kind of transaction is it going to confuse the the bookkeeper now this first one notice you could kind of leave it there and just tell just tell the bookkeeper yeah this is this is going to be uh the the where did it go the 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 interest payable is going to just be sitting there don't do anything to it just pay off your loan payables like normal and then we'll make another adjustment as of the end of the next month or the next period where we need to make an adjustment for it or possibly you could simply reverse it and then as of the first day of the following period so that again you don't confuse the bookkeeper so this this is one i think can, can basically go either way it's probably not going to be in the way of of messing anyone up because it's not actually impacting the loan balance if you break it out into its own 
separate account, but you might choose to reverse it just so you're back to the normal point. That's what we're going to do next time to see uh, the reversing entries. Note that sometimes when we look at these reversing entries, we have to determine is this a timing difference or is it a, is it a temporary difference or is it a permanent difference that uh, we are recording. So we'll kind of go over why we, re re we might reverse it next time by looking at uh, the journal entry that would happen at the next payment. In other words, next time the bookkeeper makes a payment here, uh, if they have to take this 7292 into account, that's going to make their journal entry, their payment even more difficult if they're doing it according to this amortization schedule, if they're trying to reverse this payable account as they make the payment. And we don't want to make anything more difficult on the bookkeeper. So, so that's why we could say uh, maybe we'll just reverse it and make it correct as of the cutoff date and then, and then change it. So we'll take a look at that uh, next time. But now let's go back on over and I want to open up my, my uh, journal report. So if I go to the reports on the left, we can look up a journal, journal report. And so this is often a report that you might use to present the adjusting entries that we've made. So notice this report gives a journal entry format for every type of transaction, every form type. So, but if I look at just the ones that happen at the end of the year, so if we go to a, a custom date as of 02-28-24 or 229-24, 02-29-24, -2 because all of our entries were made as of the last day, then this will li limit the amount of journal entries that we will have. We still had our paychecks at the end here, uh, and but th here's our journal entry that was actually a journal entry form. We can then sort this, for this by transaction type, which would be simply the journal forms. So if I filter this, I could say that I want to uh, filter by transaction type, and it needs to be equal to a journal, a journal entry. And so we're going to say, okay. And so now it's limited to just the journal entries. And so notice I, I still have two entries because I had this payroll adjustment that wasn't an adjusting entry. So, so then if I wanted to filter this down further, I could export it to Excel and just delete this one, this one item. But I just want to show this report because this is a common report that we might use to then explain what we did in the adjusting department, especially in a situation where the accounting department uh, is, or the bookkeeper is different than the person doing the adjusting entries. And you're trying to say, hey, look, this is the adjusting entries that we made in order to do the taxes or external reporting uh, or whatever we needed to do. All right, let's go to the trial balance now. This is where we stand on the trial balance. So we've got the balance sheet on top of the income statement here. Best report to check your work. Basically all the assets, checking accounts and asset, accounts receivables and asset, inventories and asset, investments and asset, payments to deposit, asset, prepaid insurance, asset, furniture and fixture asset, the accumulated depreciation contra asset, machinery and equipment asset. Those are what the company owns. Then we have the liabilities and equity, the flip side of the coin, who has claim to those liabilities or the value of them. Liability, who has claim to those assets, liabilities and equity. So we've got the accounts payables, a liability, visas, a liability, sales tax, liabilities. We've got the uh, interest payable is now a liability. We've got the loan payable, liabilities to the bank. We've got the payroll to the government, liabilities to the government, unearned revenue, liability to the customer for prepayments. And then we have our claim to the balance, including the owner's equity, which is draws the owner investment and the owner's equity, similar to retained earnings if it was a corporation and the entire income statement, income being credits minus expenses being debits, the difference between the two resulting in a credit balance if there was net income, which would then roll into the owner's equity equivalent to retained earnings for a corporation. And QuickBooks does that automatically on a yearly basis, which we can see if we go up one date, 010125 to 010125, we'll see that the income statement closes out, everything rolls into equity, the equivalent of retained earnings.